Greetings, tank fans. Welcome back to Totally Tanked, the podcast that's all about tanks. My name is John. It is the ooh, 17th of uh, April, 2021, and this is episode 17 by Strange Chance. Uh, my name is John, and I'm joined here in the pod by... Rob, hello. Hello, everyone, and... We're talking today about the Icon of Victory, the T-34 Russian tank, not the T-34 American tank, which would just be rubbish. You ruined my intro. See, I wanted to talk about how, you know, we enjoy talking about obscure Italian tanks and we like talking about modern tanks that have never done anything. But what we really, really like is talking about the big tanks of World War II. And we, we save them up and we, we parcel them out very gently, like doing the Tiger. That was that was a big deal. That was a big deal. And this is one of the big beasts. This is that's one of the greats. This, this is the T-34. That's right. One of the icons. Um, how, let's talk about the development of the T-34. Well, let's, just for those people who don't know, the T-34 okay. was a Russian tank built by the USSR in order to, um, at the beginning of the war, and in order to, uh, as a universal tank, medium tank. All right. 28 tons. Started out. What would you like to say about the uh, development? Uh, just that we, we've spoken before from the uh, Japanese side with the Hago tank about the seminal but very little known battles of um, Nomahan, and- Nomahan or Kalkan Gold, depending on whether you're looking at the Russian or the Japanese sources. Uh, this was in 1938 and a lot of very important things happened. One was the Japanese said, we don't want to fight the Russians. That was awful. Um, and proceeded with a sudden strategy that involved taking the Philippines and bombing Pearl Harbor and the fall of Singapore. Um, so things that um, have a huge impact even to this day to American um, and English and Australian uh, and I will also say Southeast Asian Pacific Island people, a uh, huge impact was the Japanese deciding the Russians were too tough and they were going to um, take the easy way of fighting war against the Americans. Mm. Um, the Russians also did not enjoy the experience of fighting the Japanese at Kalkan Gol and were terrified throughout the war that the Japanese were going to invade Siberia at any point. And that had a lot to do then with how Stalin arrayed his forces and um, always kept more troops in the east to possibly face Japan than he necessarily needed. Um, and also, with the development of the T-34, that the Russian, the, the tanks that they took to Kalkan Gol in 1938, I mean... The BT and the T-26, one it, was a light um, scout tank and the other one was a infantry tank, a very slow infantry tank. Yeah, and the, uh, the BT-25 was for 1938... Not a terrible tank because I don't think there was a good tank in the world in 1938. No, um, but the, so the Russians, even though they won, um, and even though they terrified the Japanese, also came away um, with a deep fear, in particular, of the Japanese, what they called the tank destroyer teams, which is basically very fanatical dudes who are willing to use Molotov cocktails up close and personal against Russian tanks, and. They had some success, but it's fundamentally not a good use of your most dedicated soldiers to throw their lives away um, tossing petrol bombs at tanks. But one of the big things from this was that the Russians learned from it and said, mm. right, what do we need to do? This is not a good activity for us to be undertaking. One, having riveted uh, steel uh, plates. Mm. Two, having petrol engines. And three, um, having armour plates that don't quite fit together so that when you do get hit by a Molotov cocktail, the... Um, the petrol, uh, flaming petrol does get inside the tank and then you're in real trouble. So yeah. all these things added up to them saying, we need a better tank than this. And this is where the design of the T-34 was uh, already in train, but they said, right, let's make something better. And they did. Yeah. I mean, it's worth noting the rivets had two problems. Um, one was that um, even if the plates all joined up, they still weren't watertight, which meant that flaming petrol came streaming in and they didn't like that. Uh, and also the general point forever with riveted tanks that the rivets, when they get hit by something hard, uh, turn into flying projectiles inside the tank, what's known as a spalling hazard. Um, and no one who's ever gone to war and been shot at in a riveted tank wanted to do it again. Um, so the Russians had the advantage of learning that earlier um, because this, this very important but very little known battle in the steppes of Manchuria. So one of the things with the T-34 and then part of the design phase was being in uh, the USSR, it was built by, there was a lot of committees involved and in order to get the go-ahead to build this and um, put it into production, they had to convince the various committees that we have built a tank that you want to spend resources on. Once the go-ahead was given, 
the production ramp up was huge. You would not believe how huge. But um, the point being is that they had to get the go ahead from the committees first. And this is where the tank designer, John, what was his name again? Colchin. Gorskin. Um, <laughs> you, you keep talking. I'll come back to that. Anyway, um, he basically he put his life and soul into the into this tank, literally, because he, in order to prove to the committee to sign off on the tank, he took the design from of it. Um, he, he took it on a road trip, two thousand kilometers um, from Stalingrad to uh, Moscow, and then up to uh, St. Petersburg or Leningrad those days, um, and then back to Moscow, showing off what how good this tank was and how reliable and durable it was that it could travel this distance and do all this stuff. He subsequently caught pneumonia and then died. But the committee was sold on what it could do. Um, and then the, the guy who designed the engine, the V12 diesel engine, so not a petrol engine. A di- Sorry, a diesel. Koshkin was Koshkin. the uh, lead engineer. Yes. All right, so the the, uh, the guy who designed the engine, the V12 diesel engine with 500 horsepower. So that okay. was Chelpan, Konstantin Chelpan. Yep. Um, he took over, uh, he, sorry, he didn't take over. He uh, got purged uh, earlier on. Uh, so again, two guys, the, the engine was a very good, well-designed engine. Can we digress for a moment on the engine? Yes. Yes. So the scale of the achievement, because we often talk about the Soviets as if what they did was primitive um, or... And it, in many respects, things that didn't need to be sophisticated, they were happy to keep primitive. I mean, they didn't equip socks to their troops until about five years ago. Because um, just wrapping bits of cloth around your feet should be good enough for anyone. Um, but the, the V12 diesel that equipped the T-34, with changes and redesigns, is still essentially the main power plant of Russian tanks to this day. It's gone from a 500 horsepower engine to about an 800 horsepower engine. But... It doesn't need to be a aircraft engine, which every good tank in World War II had some form of aircraft engine in it, except for the Russian ones. Um, and that meant that you had to make a choice between whether you wanted a plane or a tank. And most countries, except the Germans, said, let's have more planes. Lots of reasons for that. Um, but the Russians had something that didn't take up that production space, wasn't mm-hmm. coming out of that space. It was a great big diesel. It threw so out... They had fewer tractors that year, but I think yeah. they were happy with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tractor or tank, use them either way. I mean, plenty of T-34s ended their lives as um, tractors as mm-hmm. well yeah. and were built in tractor factories. So, All right, But so it, it one... was a huge achievement having this tank power plant that was a big V-12 diesel that gave them more power than they really knew what to do with in some ways. Mm. So having the... The designer of the tank uh, dying of pneumonia, the designer of the engine uh, being purged and shot. And so the de- designer of the transmission, he went on to be lead the um, the project. And, of course, the transmission was one of the parts of the tank that didn't actually work very well. Much better at surviving Soviet politics than designing transmissions. Yeah, obviously. Mm. But anyway, I just thought that was a nice mm. little... Uh, part of the tank anyway so our tank itself it's a t-34 it's got 28 tons does about 50 k's an hour on road uh, and hang on, 50 kilometers an hour for a 1940 yeah, tank yeah it was a big engine we just talked, talked with, about that with i'm sorry what was the gun on this thing 76 mil 76.2 yeah 76 well yeah i know but i'm just saying because that that at, at that range of 76 you know the point one and the point two is it's a huge different yeah mm. increase in size of the shell there, uh, there wasn't anything in 1940 with um, an equivalent gun, was there? No. Yeah. No, no, there was. Oh, sorry, the um, KBs were probably wandering around at that stage with... I think with it was the-, the same gun, they just had a lot more armour. Mm. Mm. Um, and so this is the start of the war. Two mach- uh, 7.62 short machine guns, uh, 500 horsepower engine, Christie suspension, which is, comes from the American mm. um, uh, American B... Um, uh, series yep so so Christy was a crazy American who had this idea for suspension and there's these weird American fanboys for Christy suspension to this day I'm sure if we don't give them sufficient deference they're going to start emailing us um, but so Chris, Christy had these weird ideas about tanks and they were kind of cool in that they could run on their wheels without treads and all sorts of things the Russians got rid of the the dual purpose they mm-hmm. kept the coiled spring so it was basically every wheel was its own bogey um but it had the coiled spring um i think in the by the time they got to the t3485 they moved to torsion bars which is yep. um uses more interior space but people seem happier with uh but so they had this american suspension which it made the americans like it for a while yes uh, 250 kilometer range 
if it uh, if they if it get that far, but uh, uh, without the um, transmission blowing transmission up. blowing up. Yes, yeah. there was plenty of stories about the the tank crews that carry a secondary transmission on the back of the tank. Just plenty before. of photos. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's amazing that Koshkin got the first version. I mean I know obviously it was um, a gold plated prototype mm. to do this thousand mile route march to um, to demonstrate the superior design, uh, considering that in practice that a thousand kilometer route march. I'm not sure any other T34 ever made that kind of distance without support. But no. uh, Oh, yeah, plenty of support. It didn't go without... So that, that, the thing is, by doing that, they actually learned a lot of uh, issues with the tank, and so they mm. went about fixing them. It was mm. one of the part, uh, exciting parts of this tank was the what they were willing to do for the adaptations to, and not just say, well, we built one, that's what we're going to stick with. No, it was... Yes, it was built by committee and... Uh, sorry, approved by committee. It wasn't built by committee. It was mm. approved by committee. But they... It, did go have a change process and they managed it all the way through. Um, wide tracks for the snow and mud. Um, that, which is an underrated element. I mean... Yeah, the, for Russia. The, yeah, for, for combat on the Russian steppe. I mean, the German tanks um, were forever getting bogged and the fact that they had failed to invest adequately in um, tank recovery vehicles kept biting them and biting them and biting them uh, and uh, just having wider tracks, um, partly because they were, had a lot less train tunnels to go through. Um, so starting off with the the basic T thirty four, we won't, we'll get into the eighty five later on. But the basic T thirty four had a four man crew, so the commander ended up uh, being the gunner as well as the commander. So driver, assistant driver. The assistant driver's job was to uh, take a sledgehammer to the um, gear shift to uh, change the uh, help it change gears when it, when the transmission got stuck, uh, and then, I mean, the, then the loader. Uh, normally, I'm very down on tanks with assistant drivers because it takes up an enormous amount of um, cabin space, uh, fighting compartment space. In this case, it was so physically exhausting to drive the tank. Having a second person there to um, jump in the driver's seat um, made a lot of sense. But that does speak to the design failure in the transmission that it took huge physical strength to change the gears. Hmm. So, look, when this tank came out, Started out in uh, 1940. Um, they, they improved in January 1940. Uh, by June, they'd already rolled out hundreds of, ta- of these ha- tanks. When Operation Barbarossa kicked, Barbarossa kicked off in June 41, uh, they were already available to the Russians. They had mass numbers of them. And then when the Germans invaded, uh, they fa- suddenly found that they were fighting these um, th- these perfect tanks that the Germans were, were talking about because they had a big gun, good armor, Good mobility. There were so many of them, and they were easy to make, and they were simple to use. What the Germans weren't seeing through all that was there was no doctrine, little training, poor visibility inside them, no communications because only one in five might have had a radio. The bad ergonomics because the turret didn't have a basket, so the commander and the loader had to shuffle around as the turret traversed uh, in order to make sure they were uh, they couldn't just sit there and do do stuff they had to shuffle around inside of it um, yeah um, I mean in theory if they're you know crouched into the proper position then they're sitting on their seats they're they're not mm. not losing their legs and arms as the thing whips around t34 well, does have a surprisingly fast turret traverse the 85 which, does the mm. 34 only had a uh, mechanical yeah right traverse. okay um, um, there was poor reliability and non-standard design so all these things so but what the Germans saw in 1941 was a tank that their weapons couldn't penetrate couldn't stop were out being outmaneuvered by with a gun that was going straight through their armor so suddenly where they'd had um, battlefield dominance with their tanks for the last however many years suddenly they came up against something and they go goodness this is this is too hard yeah i mean it didn't stop him going straight through them but that is leads to that leans on all the issues that the, or the pros that we went into the design of the T34 yeah i mean the, the the germans had met superior tanks in a way in the um the char and samua um heavy french tanks um which again had terrible, like the, those were one man turrets where the commander was expected to um, load, fire, and command the tank. And, and um, even now were tanks built for the last war. Oh, yeah, totally. But in terms of the fact that they had huge guns and, and heavy armor um, and required the attacking Germans to outflank them, uh, and they, to, you know, they had at least had the experience of doing that. They knew how to, how to deal with heavy tanks. Um, but I mean, it, it's it's little appreciated that yes, the Germans inflicted horrific losses on the Soviets in Barbarossa. 
but they also suffered horrific losses. They gained thousands of kilometers of territory, but they lost, um, I b- believe it was in the order of a million men in six weeks, um, which is a, a, a huge body blow to, to any force. I mean, it's a huge body blow to any nation to lose a million people. Um, but so the Germans were like, oh my God, what are these tanks? Because I mean, you know, when they thought, oh, we're going to attack the Russians, they, they thought they were attacking an inferior enemy. And it was a big surprise to discover that just like they didn't have tanks in 1936, uh, neither did the Russians. But then suddenly... Well, well, oddly enough, all, they, they both all... had the same tank school in the Soviet <laughs> Union that they <laughs> shared officers and tanks with. <laughs> but they all looked down upon the other one, even though yeah, they should have realised that uh, there were things happening behind the scenes. Obviously, their spies weren't very good. Um, look, from all that... Uh, on the advance, the Germans were more likely to see the T-34s because of the poor visibility of the you know, T-34 commanders um, and also more likely to fire because the commander is also the gunner. He's trying to do everything. There was no communication between the tanks. So you'd have a platoon of tanks, of five tanks, moving up. And as long as the Germans took out the first one, the other four would be sitting around going, waving flags and saying, what's going on? Because there was no communications between them. Yeah, it was this weird pre-World so War Two idea that, um, oh, they can just wave flags at each other to signal, which involves sticking your head out of the tank in the middle of a firefight. I blame fight. the Navy people for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, Navy people weren't waving flags at each other by, <laughs> by then, I can tell you. I bet they were still using flags. Uh, signal lights, um, they were quite keen on at that point. But... Um, you could operate a signal light from um, buttoned in. <laughs> anyway. In fact, so, Prince Philip was a signal light operator at the Battle go. of Manifan. There you go. Um, God rest his soul. Yep. Hmm. Um, so, look, other things, other little facts, facts and stats about the T-34. Um, there were 84,000 built over a very, very long period of time. Is it the most produced tank? No, no, world? that's the T-55, T-55 which we've okay. already done. This is the second most produced tank. Most but, produced tank of the Second World War, though. Uh, yes, yes, definitely mm. that. Uh, but also the most destroyed tank of the Second World War, having 44,000 losses. So that's 50%. That was, that was kind of the doctrine, though. I know, that's it? exactly <laughs> right. That was... <laughs> They weren't going as uh, we with the Shermans, we talked about uh, quantity is its own quality. T34, it's not quite the same equation to my mind because you've got to have a little bit of quality to be able to use that quantity effectively they just went for mass quantity and i wouldn't call that quality of its own if we're going to compare the m4 to the t34 and there's reasons to do that engine probably i would say better in the t34 um main gun better armor better that's that's a big head start for any tank yes that's a that's your three basics yeah that's- um having said that things like the sophistication of the sherman that it, every tank had a radio um everyone in the tank was on an intercom um the tanker's suits were all electrically electrically heated um and and that is no small thing it to we we joke it constantly about crew comfort and our tankers should be hard and all that sort of thing. But the, the more comfortable you make them, the longer they can be functional. Yeah, exactly right. The fatigue is a is just drains you early and makes you make mistakes. Mm. Simple as that. You're going to make more mistakes when you're fatigued than if you're uh, warm with a cup full of tea in you and uh, ready to fight. Yeah, um, and uh, all of those things... If, if you ask me to go to war in a 1941 Sherman versus an end of war T-34-85, I'd probably pick the T-34-85. Well, it depends how long the battle's going to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but um, you know, a, an end of war Sherman, particularly when they went to the wet stowage of the ammunition, when they had the 76 millimeter gun, uh, I'd probably still pick the Sherman. I reckon I'd be more likely to come out of that alive. Mm. Um, but, you know, the, the Russians had a lot more, um, shall we say, total and complete um, dedication to the conflict, um, which didn't necessarily include survivability of tank crews or training of tank crews particularly. Yeah, now one of the complaints with the first turret, uh, again, was a single hatch on top. So if something happened inside the tank, yeah, nobody was getting out of there quick. Well, the commander might get away, but yeah. no, no one else. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, dry stone, you know, the, the turret is literally full of um, ammunition, mm. um, which, if, if things are going wrong, is... Just stored in boxes on the on the floor. Well, that too. Yeah, yeah. that's that's where it was. There were no there was no storage bins or anything useful mm. like that. It was... The ergonomics inside the turret was... 
But from externally, for what the Germans were seeing, they were seeing a tank with the high mobility, tank. <laughs> high mobility, big gun, mm. and armor that was bouncing because they had sloped armor. That's the other thing the Germans weren't doing. So mm. the Russians had done and saying they've built their tanks with this sloped armor that um, was lighter and uh, could be thicker uh, and would more likely to bounce shots. Now, now, Rob, you came up with a very good analogy um, for why sloped armor is good um, a few months ago here, which was that it's like. When you're soaring across a log, if you saw at 90 degrees across the log, that's the shortest path. And if you have to saw at an angle across the log, you have to saw through more log. I think that's you're attributing something to that I said to somebody else, or no, sorry, the other way around. No, it's definitely you. No, I've, um, I've never I'm, said that before. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that that that, that expo- but that, some, they sound a very smart person, so I'll take yeah, it. But but the thing that sloped armor does lose you is a huge amount of interior volume of the tank, which is why the Russians also said if anyone's tall than five foot five, tank is not the place for them. No. Um, we have lots of other places we can put tall people, um, but inside a tank, no. I heard this from the uh, Bovington Tank Chats uh, video, and I thought to myself, that is a really profound statement. Um, At the beginning of the war, there were two schools of thought about how the Russians wanted to uh, fight things. That was the, the war of attrition or the war of annihilation. The war of attrition was how the Russians had always fought their wars, which was pull back, destroy the land uh, the enemies were invading through, and just use the vastness of Russia to accomplish that. Now, they, that was uh, what became their, their war. The, the, in the early war was the, the war of attrition for Russia. All right? But the other doctrine was the war of annihilation, where they'd already set out how they want to do this back in, the, uh, back in 1940 and said, well, no, we're going to take the war to the enemy and we're going to advance and assault and attack. But they, didn't, they weren't on a position to do that at the, in the early war. And the T-34 embodies this this doctrine of attrition and annihilation because in the early war they had they had this big gun good armor good mobility and they slowed and they slowed the german advance all the way across to uh, the eastern front and inflicted horrendous casualties on the germans which mm-hmm. is the underappreciated part yes russian casualties were more horrendous definitely got very close to the point where the russians couldn't um make good those casualties, but not quite. Um, but also the Germans were losing enormous numbers of um, irreplaceable uh, personnel along the way. And, but then along the way, <clears throat> what happened was <laughs> the T-34 was a symbol of the adaptation of, for, for Russia of the, um, from the early war to late war and the, the uh, transition from attrition to annihilation because during this same period of 41 to 43 the t-34 has gone through they uh, the the russians have adapted the design the requirements of the t-34 and the location one of the massive things that the, uh, the russians did was their tank factories were under threat uh through the german advance they picked up whole cities put them on the railway and moved them to the other side of uh, the ural mountains and then put them down again and built the factories in order to build tanks. Now, um, what do we, how do we want to say it? Chil, Chelyabinsk. Yep, sounds good. Tankograd is yes. what they called it. Mm-hmm. And that Which means tank city. Tank yep. city. They just churned out tanks. Mm-hmm. Thousands and thousands. At the, at the highest point, they were churning out uh, 12 to 1,300 tanks a, a month. Yep. The Germans um, weren't doing anything like that. No, and, but also because the Germans didn't have a total command planning system until, you know, Albert Speer in um, 1944 started to finally, um, when the Germans realised they were losing, um, settle down and start properly planning things out. And industrial production in Germany rose even in the final years of the war, um, despite being bombed by, um, you know, thousand bomber raids constantly because they finally started to plan things properly. Russians were doing this level of planning right from the yeah, start. And that's where the we look at the um, corruption and uh, sluggishness of Russian committees and you think that uh, in your mind. But the T-34 epitomised what it was to have a the ability to s- direct industry to say, you will do this. And it picked up these factories, these cities, and moved them. And they took all the people, and they took all the equipment, and they built a new city 
to build more yeah. tanks. And it was huge. That's yeah. a huge undertaking. Yeah. And that was part of this adaptation. During the, uh, the production of the T-34, not only did they um, start making more of them, but they made them cheaper. Mm. Um, so they made more, faster, and they made them cheaper. And they made them. They took the complexity of the original tank and they simplified it. So they so, they made, uh, so even the barrel, uh, the gun assembly, um, they took had started out with eight hundred parts. They ended up only having six hundred parts. So they simplified as much as they could. Mm. Um, they took out driver's seats and other things and said, "Well, you can sit on your great coat if you really need to have a seat and things like that." But I you know that's bad. So, uh, planning and uh, the way they put things together. But mm. the point is is that they undertook this adaptation and at the end of it, they said during all this, they built. They decided we need a bigger gun. When they started seeing the T-34 losing to the Panthers and the Tigers and the Panzer IVs with the bigger guns, um, they said we need a bigger gun. They tried the T-43, didn't work. So what they did, what did they do, John? They took the turret of the T-43 and they stuck it on the T thirty four, and they had the T thirty four eighty five. It had the big gun. It can still ach- it was still achieving what it was before. Yeah. Now let's let's now we've we've brought the eighty five in. Yep. Now I love this. Germans when they built the Tiger said, "What's the gun we love the most? It's the eighty eight. What are we going to do? We're going to take the eighty eight and we're going to modify it. And that was obviously an anti aircraft gun that had been pressed into anti tank service when they battles weren't going well. Um, and they put that in the Tiger. Hooray! And the Russians said, you know what? If the Germans can put an 88 in um, their tank, what's our best anti-aircraft gun that also smashes tanks? It's the 85. Um, and, 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 th- and, and thus it was so. And I mean, I've seen videos of the inside of the T-34-85 turret. And it is horrific, the idea that a loader who cannot have been more than five foot two um, w- was grabbing these enormous T-85 shells that were basically the length of the turret. Like, you know, plus or minus 30%. Um, there was not a lot of space to swing a, um, a shell around inside the turret and somehow cram it into the breach to fire. T-34 was, throughout its career, always accused of being a slow-firing tank. Mm. Uh, the Germans reckon they could get three rounds off for every one the T-34 fired. But as we also know, it's the first round that matters in tank f- warfare, not the second and third. For the Russian, for the Germans, though, they were saying, well, we spotted them first, we fired first, we killed the first one, it's the other... Th- Three, seven, ten behind it that uh, we had trouble. A bit of a problem, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's another thing as well. I, I also think at this point I want to bring up um, underwater welding. Um, because why not? Because why not? This was, a, but this was again, we have this idea that's perpetuated by, um, you know, our, our, all of our media is owned by, you know, billionaires and they always want to tell us communism was terrible and many things about communism were terrible. Um, but the idea that the Soviets were unsophisticated or unscientific, it doesn't bear, um, reality in many ways. They had a lot of leading edge science, not the West also had a lot of leading edge science, but the Russians weren't left behind in this stuff. And one of the things they realized was that when you are welding, and I say this is someone who welds bicycle frames reasonably often, um, you either need what you call a fluxed core in your welding material, um, which releases a gas. So it keeps the oxygen away. Cause if, if your weld has air around it, um, you've got super hot metal, it oxidizes and basically rusts on the spot. So you either spray argon gas all around your welding, or you have a fluxed core, which releases the gas as you're, you're melting it with your weld or what the Russians figured out. And they were the first in the world to do this. And I believe the only in world war two. If you can move the whole assembly that you're trying to weld underwater, no air can get to it while you're welding. And it gave them extremely strong welds, um, much easier once you submerge it and keep everyone's hands and feet out of the water while you've got the electrical arc going. Um, So that was good. I would also note there's a huge variance in the quality of T-34s. Oh, good. Um, Some of them built on Monday mornings um, in factories that were just trying to make quota and not caring about anything else were appalling, had huge gaps in the, in the armor at the seams, um, needed sledgehammers to work the transmissions. Some of them, um, built on days when everyone was sober and all the parts were available, were very different beasts to that. And what's interesting is that the, the committees who were looking, running these factories knew this. They knew that there were deficiencies at certain times. But rather than saying, yep, we need to institute something to change it, they said, no, nothing slows down production. 
We're going to keep churning them out. Yes, 10% are going to be crap. Mm. A bad T34 is considered to be better than no T34. Exactly. We're just going to... And any sort of changes to the production at that level, at that low level of the factory itself... Would de- would be detrimental to overall production, whereas any changes would have to come from the top down, not at the bottom bottom end. And say, yep, uh, Joe was uh, welding badly on this day, and therefore we uh, th- this hull's going to crack as soon as it goes over a bump. Who cares? That's one. We've got another hundred going out today. Yeah, I mean, it's not ideal. But for their point of view, mm. from what they were trying to achieve. Yeah, it was better to keep things going than to try and change things at the low level. Changes came from high, not from low. Hmm. Okay, so the other now that we've got into the T thirty four eighty five, the other really important thing was that it had more hatches, it had much better cupolas, it had much better optics, uh, as you might expect from a had, turret that was basically it designed. even had a gunner. Yeah, it even had a gunner. So the commander a had a radio in every tank, but also no longer... Not every tank. Uh, Most tanks. Fitted for, not with. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also stopped having to do all these other things and could be trying to look around, figuring out where they were, what was going on. And as we've constantly talked about throughout history, taking the load off the tank commander, leaving them free to do nothing but... Command. Command. Figure out the, what the tank is supposed to be doing gives you a more successful tank. It is much more important than... 20 millimetres of armour or uh, 20 millimetres of cannon diameter. Um, it, the, the single most important thing for a good fighting vehicle is a commander who is aware of their situation. And can apply the uh, resources required to the situation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Look, I think we might take a break there and come back and talk about the change to the annihilation phase with the T-3485. Okay. So, Rob, tell me about the Battle of Annihilation. All right. So, the phase of Annihilation is what I want to talk about is with the transition of the T-34 from the basic 75mm gun to 75mm gun to the 85. Mm-hmm. Um, you went from a war of attrition whereby they lost a lot of tanks to this war of Annihilation where they were taking the fight to the enemy. So, suddenly, it was the new assault tank for the Russians and taking uh, taking on the German advances. Basically, once they'd stalled the Germans, they then had these tanks, the new 85s, to take the fight to them and actually carry out breakthrough operations as, as assault tanks. I mean, and, and probably no more stark manner can this be made than the Battle of Stalingrad, where the Stalingrad tank factory was literally churning um, T-34s into the front line 100 metres well, away. They from... were the old ones. They were... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, but but my, my point was... They, they were still the Battle of Attrition. And <laughs> it was a huge battle. The, the, from some of the tanks, uh, they rolled out um, They rolled out 400 tanks to, mm. uh, uh, to uh, as part of a breakthrough operation. Oh, sorry, a breaking the German advance operation. I can't remember the name of it. Sorry. Mm. Um, of those... Um, where was it? Uh, 340 of those T-34s were, went out of action, but only 66 of those were from uh, enemy action. Mm. So the others just broke down. Yeah, but but it, to, to still literally on the battlefield be producing tanks. Yeah, uh, this, this, is a, this is a very good point, is that uh, they were rolling tanks straight off the production line, unpainted, with pretty much nothing in them straight into the battlefield. Now, well, they would have done a few bits and pieces until they started before they started shooting at things, but mm. they were getting them straight out there. There were no paint jobs, just, just bare steel yeah. um, going out into the fight because that was still happening. This yeah. is, they had not picked up um, the pl- the factory from Stalingrad yet mm. to move it behind the... Yeah, but, but, but my, my point is that through the course of Stalingrad, you go from the sheer desperation of you know the um, the, the room to room fighting with with tanks literally being churned off the production line hundreds of meters away from the front line, to the encirclement of the uh, von Polis's army, mm. to the counter attacks that then led to German forces being you know encircled and cut off um, as they retreated you know over the the, the later years of the war across mm. across Russia back into Germany. Um, you know, so that transition from attrition to annihilation really was 
right there in that one it spot was. over the, over yeah, a couple hundred fir- meters. <laughs> that, that was the furthest point that the Germans got so in their in the war. And after that, it was a case of they stopped there. That was the war of attrition. And then coming after that was the war of annihilation, annihilation where which the T thirty four eighty five did rule supreme as it pushed back across um, back across Russia and into Germany. So we, they had, we, we should it, note that the KV, which we have done in a previous podcast, was still the the breakthrough tank. If yes. you really needed to assault a hard point, you wanted the, the heavier armor, the more elite, the the, the special tank mm. that was the the KVs and then the ISs, which was basically the same series of tanks. Yeah. So. so the eighty five had the bigger gun, better communications, better training, uh, better doctrine, better armor, more reliable, better ergonomics inside the tank. So we talked about before, it's got a three person turret it also had a turret basket so you didn't chop your leg off when you spun the turret around yeah, pretty much um <laughs> it had a better turret it had better visibility one of the other things was it had uh, handholds welded onto the outside for carrying infantry so you could sit your uh, troop of in- uh, a troop of infantry on the outside of the tank and they would go into battle now this is very important for a um an advancing uh, military uh, advancing forces to have infantry to go with you because your tanks can drive through somewhere but if you've got don't have infantry to hold it you're going to lose whatever ground behind you and suddenly you might be cut off rather than you cutting off the enemy this was part of the russian concept of deep battle going back to the 1930s um and you know in in some ways you can say deep battles just combined arms by a different name but the but the idea that you fight the enemy immediately in front of you while you engage them in their supply lines while you engage them um, 100 miles behind the front line and you engage them all the time uh, in, in all the ways and that way they are unable to um, respond is the it's Rus- a powerful way to approach a battlefield. The, Ru- the Russians had de- defence in depth built into their doctrines as to as to how much they had 7, 8, 10 kilometres worth of defences built up for any sort of advance the, the Germans were throwing at them. But they also built in this idea of uh, attack in depth. Mm. So it was a case of not just hitting the front line and then we've done done our first bit. No, it was taking these, um, these new tanks with their squads of infantry on them, moving them forward, breaking through the lines, deploying the infantry, consolidating the wins, uh, and then doing it again and again and again. And I mean, was, the, the uh, idea was also that they're supposed to pierce the front lines and then hook around, hmm. um, flanking the uh, the troops in the front lines and, and cutting off salients and, and, and such like, which takes us to Kursk at some point. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Biggest tank battle ever? Yes. I mean, the T-34 was, was huge in Kursk. And from a superficial point of view, the Germans were like, ha ha, um, we've destroyed thousands of Russian tanks for the loss of mere hundreds of hours. And the Russians um, looked and said, ha ha, we have destroyed um, hundreds of German tanks and they don't have any more. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, Kursk is a weird one in that both sides initially were like, hey, we've won. Yay. Um, <laughs> but um, then it comes down to who has to retreat. Yeah. <laughs> Who does not like the winter in Russia? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but but the, the T thirty that was just before the T thirty four eighty five came out, Kursk. But it did demonstrate that um, the Russian concept of large numbers of tanks of T thirty fours was still um, very dangerous to even the astonishing number of Panthers and Tigers that the Germans um, put and together. At Panzer IVs, which are yeah. which were prob- the, the more predominant tank of the Germans running around at the time. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the, the funny thing about the Panzer IV was that, of course, it was designed as a support vehicle and just because of the, the, the Panzer III obsoleting out faster than they'd hoped for, um, ended up with this support vehicle um, becoming a, a mainline tank with extra armour and a bigger gun bolted onto it. Yes. But at some point soon, we'll probably have to do a podcast about the Panzer IV. Uh, <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Tease, tease. Yeah, we're talking about. <laughs> now, I think we should do a beer, beer review. review. What have we got? we got a Czech Heenan Weir, Bruin de Mollen. Yeah. Bre- oh, sorry, Brewedge. So, Brewedge just means brewery, yep. so that's fine. So, de Molen is the name of the brewery, which is a French name, which is odd for a Czech beer. And Heenan Weir does sound a little bit like here. It's, it sounds like the German army in a funny way. But, um, <laughs> okay, the reason I chose this because yes. we did a Russian stout last time, so I thought, right, well, I'm not doing that again, so we need to try something new. Now, we, and do, Czechs- have, we do have Russian listeners to this podcast. 
great. We've, we've seen you on the map, my friends. We, 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 know, we, we love you. We know you're out there. Now, what I want is for you to suggest a Russian beer that we should be talking about. So, send us a message. That we can on actually the, get in Canberra. Uh, <laughs> th- 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 that we can get mailed in. So, um, get in touch. Um, where, whatever platform you're listening to this on, there'll be a comment fun- function. Um, or look us up on Facebook, Totally Tanked. And um, send us a message about what Russian beer we should be talking about because we are going to do another Russian tank at some point. Really? Yeah, this I'm seems sure, likely. I think, I think likely, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so, this, so this is a Czech beer because, um, well... They did build T-34s. They and did build Czech, T-34s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So after, uh, after World War II, when, well, the Russians made lots of people build lots of their tanks, um, they the Czechs built some. So this... Is again, I was saying before that we'd already done uh, this company has already done, uh, it also does double box and stouts and other bits and pieces that we'd done in the last couple of weeks. And I saw the name on this one, and it says Triple Ish. And I thought, well, it I also don't... says in very small print that I have to angle my glasses to the right focus to read um, extra strong beer, and also says in brackets back and forth. I think Heen and Weir means back and forth. Oh, no, so okay. yep. that, that kind of that that encapsulates the um, attrition annihilation. Um, <laughs> yeah, twenty percent Plato mean. Uh, Plato is the amount of sugar. It's got a lot. Oh, okay. um, yeah, it is a sweet beer, and mm, sweetness is not something you try for in a beer. But if you want to make a nine point two percent alcohol one like this, it's got to have a lot of sugar for the alcohol mm-hmm. for the yeast to work with. So, um, yep, yeah, it's got that. Um, 330 mil bottle, uh, mm-hmm. 9.2% alcohol. Yeah, it's, it's they not tell, They tell us to drink it at nine, 8 degrees Celsius. Well, this is Australian. We don't do that sort of rubbish. Uh, actually, my beer fridge runs at 8 degrees, so I don't freeze well, my beer was, lines. Well, this was in the other fridge. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Which would be set at 4. Anyway. Um, As I say, we're strong. We don't do that. Yeah. We, we like a beer cold because it's like so hot outside. Cause... Yep. Um, On this lovely autumn day, which we'll get, which was... Absolutely beautiful. Before, it's slowly starting to cool down right now. Well, it's 19 degrees outside. Mm, it's all right. It's cooling down. Yeah. Um, look, this is strong beer. And yeah. strong be- but it's, yeah. not as, it's just as strong as the last two we've had. <laughs> yeah. And not as strong as some of the other ones, the Czech beers I could have bought. Yeah, so it's a beautiful amber colour. I nearly dropped it then. Um, it's a lovely, dense head. Uh, There's a lot of... You can't see through the glass, that's for sure. It's got a little bit of chill haze on it. Um, hops is very old world um, hop regime, which is fine for the style. Um, I, as, as, Aside from as a novelty, as like, look at us, it's a Czech beer. I, I'm not sure when I'm ever going to buy one. Oh, probably not, but um, <laughs> it's a Czech beer and uh, I've tried something different. Look, c- compared to other strong beers um, that, that a lot of people might have tried, like the English strong lagers, um, which are appallingly bad beers, this is delightful. It's pleasant to drink. Oh, it is. Um, and, and, and I quite like the uh, sweetish flavour yeah. to it, I've got to say. Yeah, I mean, slightly treacly. Um, and it, it's not actually that easy to make strong beers. Um, cause you need a massively heavier grain bill in your, um, in your brewing process. So well done them. And I imagine. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Have, have I buggered up and say, is this a bloody Dutch beer? Oh, crikey. Oh, Rob, what have you done? Well, it was on the shelf. It's all, it's all Dutch to me. Um, I was thinking the Brow Ridge is a, yeah, um, Dutch I'm thing. I'm sorry, my folks. So it's, uh, would you turn a Dutch was, beer It, it was on the check. Yeah. It was on the check beer shelf. The Dutch had nothing to do with the T thirty four, but Look, Rob, my- Rob, Rob's bottle shop had a Dutch beer on the Czech beer shelf, and here we are. Czech, uh- Czech beer shelf. <laughs> it was the Czech beer shelf. Sorry. Dutch beer on the Czech beer shelf. Um, so maybe it's maybe a- the sign was for the shelf below. It's an honorary Czech yeah. beer. Um, uh-huh. So apologies to our Czech and Russian um, yeah. listeners. Um, having said that, Heen and Weir... I had my beer goggles, goggles on and uh, didn't obviously didn't read it right. Strong Dutch beer, um, quite pleasant. The, the font is very small for mm. a minute of our age. If you're at a pub and your friends have been there for an hour before you and you want to kind of catch up, this is a good beer to give a go to. <laughs> that's that's my situation where this would be a beer I'd go to. Um, 
Yeah, quite lovely. Anyway, Battle of Annihilation. Rob, what, yes. what more have you got? Uh, no, that was pretty much it with the T-34 to uh, 85. To That was the transition. Mm-hmm. And it was because it, it was an icon of, uh, as I said before, I think the catch cry of the T-34 is the icon of victory. Each one, a lot of people say it was the best tank in the world. And other people say it was the worst tank in the world because of all the deficiencies, the to, initial to, thing. To be, to be fair, some of them were the worst tank in the world and some of them were the best tank in the world. Exactly. Um, but the point being is that overall, it was an icon of victory. It showed Russia at its great moment of defending the motherland and defeating the Nazis. All right, yeah. it was it it was a it is the quintessential point of defeating the Nazis. But it was after being overrun mm. and so many lives lost. It, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, the Russian government presently, is now going around the world and buying up all the old ones that are still in service, bringing them home and refurbishing them and then running them out in order for building up nationalistic and jingoistic pride within the Russian people. We all like a good parade on I know, but they're, they're, they're doing yeah. it for a specific yeah. reason. It's, it's, it, they're building up the nationalism because Dude, they we, have... we just had a hundred plane fly over for the anniversary of the Air Forces. Um, yeah, we did that you know. once every hundred years. Yeah, well, they're, they're doing yeah, it every year. And- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, everyone likes to do this stuff. I don't, mm. I'm, I'm not, you know, I've got a lot of things against Putin's Russia, but I think this one's uh, fair enough. I'd be doing the same I, thing too. Uh, it, it's, it's something to be wary of and that they yeah. are build, trying to build up nationalism and being a nationalistic symbol, the T-34 is getting uh, a lot of increased uh, notoriety within Russia because T-55 never won a war, did it? But the T-34 did. Uh, never won a Russian war. No. Um, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, I, I think the thing to understand, the T-55, like all really good weapons of war, represented a totality of national will and um it it's been said by better minds than me that the thing about the t-34 was that everything that had to be good was good and the things that didn't have to be good were bad because it didn't matter Mm. um you know do the armor plates join up at the back doesn't matter no because if something's getting around the back to shoot you in the ass then yeah Yeah. it's bad anyway sure um you know optics russian optics get a bum rap um i know that russian cameras um soviet cameras of of that era are actually very highly sought after by professional photographers um they did actually have a good optics industry that they had imported from germany um switzerland and yeah prior to the war so that the russian optics were not necessarily bad the, the point is that the 80, even with the 85mm gun, its effective range was around 1,900 metres and the optics were just fine for operating at that. Yeah. And do you need to see with crystal clarity things you can't shoot at? Not really. Um, and, and I also keep noting, um, if you honestly think that a tank should be engaging with its main gun things at 5,000 metres, go and stand 5,000 metres away from something else and ask yourself if you can see a car at that distance. Um, because I have actually measured out these distances, and the, <laughs> there's it, a, there's a YouTube video of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, uh, and that was just one kilometer. Um, you know, you can't actually see that much at these distances. Um, you know, and and in the modern era when you've got radars and infrared search and track systems, you 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 can do more. But um, back in the day when it was just you know human brains and eyeballs. Um, it's very hard, even with magnification, um, to, to make things out of those those long ranges. Now, moving on from World War Two, because this tank didn't stop. No, the world... when the war start when the war stopped, no. right? The world kept on going, and guess what? The tank kept on going as well. So um, even here in Canberra, our lovely city, um, at the Australian War Memorial, they have a T thirty four eighty five out at their Trelaw uh, annex. That's available on certain days of the year, and um, now assuming that the Australian borders ever reopen, which I'm kind of ho- I'm not enjoying living in a hermit kingdom. 
Um, the redevelopment of the War Memorial, which is a contentious issue. Very. Um, but it appears to be going ahead, will mean that they'll be opening up the Trelaw Annex while the memorial is closed uh, for the redevelopment. Oh, okay. um, So, um, it, it, and for listeners to this show, if you... More, more so than the memorial, which is a lot of Australian history and Australian context for a small number, smallish number of objects. The annex is literally just huge sheds full of tanks and V two uh, and V two rockets <laughs> and V two rockets and planes, and but it's just sheds full of really interesting gear. I, and, I, I haven't been there in like twenty years, mm. but I do remember the time going through there and going and being taken on a personal tour and saying, "Yeah, this stuff is cool," because yeah. I like that sort of stuff. Yep. So in two years' time, so say twenty, what are we? Twenty twenty three. Um, the annex, I imagine, will be pretty much open on a daily basis while they compensate for having the main museum closed. Uh, so that would be a very good time for a war nerd to visit Canberra. Yeah, there you uh, go. So anyway, they've got a T-3485 out there at the Mitchell Annex, and um, it's got a cast hull, so two-piece two, two piece cast hull that was welded to welded together. Uh, it was from the Zavod plant number 183 in Nizhny Tigel, which made thirty five thousand tanks during the Jesus. period of the, during the period of the war. Thirty five thousand. Mm. All right, that's the biggest tank producer tank producing factory of the war. All right, of having eighty thousand produced, this one factory produced thirty five thousand. So sorry, did they make thirty five thousand T thirty fours or thirty five thousand? Yes. Yeah, right. Okay, so they made most of them then. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, so okay, this- so a good example. There mm. we go. Um, on your camera. So it, yeah, it's a cast cast hull, uh, mm-hmm. two piece cast hull welded in one spot. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's. Uh, I remember uh, looking at it and saying, "Oh wow, that's uh, pretty impressive." And that was twenty years ago when I saw that. Uh, mm. Finding out about the how they cast the hulls. Basically, it's just a shape. Pour the metal in, and bang, you're done. Well, the we will at one point talk about the Australian Sentinel tanks, um, which were made in abject desperation in World War II, um, where they used sand pits and abundant steel to um, build the structure. But, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. No, no, we haven't finished because, no. as I said, tanks, the, the, the tank didn't stop after 1945. Mm-hmm. It kept on going. And, in fact, it is still going. So, um, during the... Well, straight up uh, during uh, in the fifties with um, in Korea and uh, sorry even before Korea there was the Manchurian ac- activities uh, straight after the war where the T thirty four was r- running over the Japanese in Manchuria. Yeah, I mean that was the tail end of World War Two. Mm. It's still formally part of the war. True, uh, but but it is an underappreciated, um, highly underappreciated. Uh, a lot of capitalist propaganda that sounds more lefty than I aim to be, but that's fundamentally <laughs> what it is. Try and rub out the Russian involvement at the end of World War II against uh, Japan and say, oh, it was the nuclear bomb that won it and uh, and the threat of American landing um, when, in fact, the um, the huge fight... There were 3 million Japanese soldiers. There were 5 million Russian soldiers. Um, and um, the the uh, just this masterpiece of military planning, the um, Russian um, smashing of uh, Japanese Manchuria and the um, previously elite Manchukuo army. Um, really quite amazing. And T-34 streaming across um, northern China to, um, yeah, you know, and, and in many ways more so than the nuclear bombs. That was why the Japanese were like, okay, we are going to call an end to this um, conflict. First time they've actually really lost in mass land battles. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, the... Um, up until then, they, they felt they'd acquitted themselves well and things were a bit of a draw, but um, to to lose three, a three million man army in the space of six weeks um, was something that they had not experienced up until that point. And for any Australians who eventually get to go start going on ski holidays again to uh, Japan, to Niseko, because the place is full of bloody Australians. Um, well, direct Qantas flights will do that. <laughs> 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 that little that station up the top of the hill that uh, you're not allowed to go near yes that is 
the Japanese military uh, monitoring the Russians who aren't far away from where the ski fields are. So yeah, well, the Sakhalin Islands are still yeah, exactly. disputed. Yeah. I know, and well, uh, that's where. So that's why they say do not ski up here, even if the powder looks really, really good, <laughs> <laughs> which is what Australians are known to do. <laughs> <laughs> where's, the, where's the powder yeah <laughs> alright so then they, they had the 60s and 70s uh, the T-34s operating through the Middle East on um, most of the Ar- in the Arab Israeli wars and then the I mean after the mid 50s anyone who could would go with the T-55 the T-55 is but there were, but an there evolution was... of the T-34 in yeah. some ways oh, a but lot of a ways. better tank in yeah. every way yeah. <laughs> right, of course it was but uh, they were still producing them in Egypt mm. in the 60s and 70s. Um, well, it's because it's easy. They had been redesigned and refined to the point anyone could and make And the them. Russians were ex- exporting them and selling yeah. them for cheap. Yeah. Um, again, and then in the 70s, they made it into Cyprus for the Greeks to uh, try and oust the um, the Turks and various activities going on in Cyprus there. There were T-34s mm. operating. Um in the late seventies and eighties, uh, they were fighting in Namibia. Um, uh, the f- revolutionary forces of N- Namibia uh, got uh, sent ten tanks that were then stationed in Angola, and they were trained by the Cubans. They were fighting the South Africans, but they weren't allowed to fight. Uh, they weren't allowed to take the tanks into Namibia because then the South Africans would escalate, and it was all a bit of a Cold War situation because that's what it was. But mm. eventually, um, they've still got. Uh, a number of T-34s N- the, now that when the South Africans are um, uh, left um, the revolutionary forces took over Namibia and formed the military there and they've still got T-34s operating as part of their military I'd love to know which is more uncomfortable operating a T-34 in the middle of winter in the Russian steppe or operating a T-34 in the blazing sun of um, oh the Namibian desert yeah wow that would be They'd both be horrible. Yeah, that would really... Work. <laughs> All right, uh, in, the, in Afghanistan, after the uh, Russians invaded uh, in 79, again, they s- instituted a puppet government and they gave them, that puppet government and their military, a lot of T-34s, and so they were operating through the 80s. Uh, At some point, you're like, yeah, thanks for this piece of junk. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm not calling the T-34 a piece of junk in its time and place, and its time and place is 1943. Um, but by 1980s in Afghanistan, you you, you really wanted at least a T-55. Um, You'd think so. Mm. Um, still operating in the Balkans. They operated in the Balkans in, in the 90s. So mm-hmm. again, uh, all, all the Kosovo activities and so forth. There were T-34s running around there. There comes a point where you're just firing up museum pieces because you've got nothing better though. But they were still operating and they were still being used and uh, still form part of the military of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Mm-hmm. And... 2015, the mm. Houthi rebels were using them to in Yemen to um, take out uh, and to inv- uh, to push out uh, government forces around there. Yeah, look, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for the Houthis. Um, they are um, crazy, starved people fighting desperately to survive. And um, Shias versus Sunnis, and you just think, why can't they figure this? Shit? <laughs> but then again, Protestants versus Catholics, Catholics in six yeah. in the seventeenth century. When yeah. what's the difference? <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I, I, I wish but, better tanks for the Houthis than than T thirty fours in the in the twenty first century. But you look, um, uh, as of twenty eighteen, there were still nine countries using them, uh, mm-hmm. either ha- having them or actively using them. Being- well, as as we discovered with the T fifty five episode um it turns out that even in pretty unsophisticated societies you can make ammunition for tanks so once you've got a, a rolling tank with a 76.2 or even better the 85 um gun and you've got diesel fuel and um you've got a big agricultural engine that won't quit mm-hmm. then just keep going <laughs> yeah so um where before we talked about the t55 and a ukrainian museum getting um started up and uh refurbished and sent back out to the front lines to fight the uh russian insurgents um there some of the same possibly people uh got into a museum and started up the t34s but they didn't roll them out to fight in the battles but they started them up and they worked um but cuba yemen Congo, uh, not the DRC, but the actual Republic of Congo, Guinea, Guinea Bissau, mm. Namibia, North Korea, Laos, and Vietnam uh, were all operating uh, T 34s in uh, 2018. Now they're either in storage or active duty. Um, Laos just sold 
off theirs, as I was saying before, sold them back to the Russians at a nice tidy profit for the Russians to be able to use them for uh, their nationalistic jingoism to roll around the country to say, look at this, this is the this is the last war we won, big time, it was 1945, and this is the symbol that did it. So I'm going to be a, bit, a little bit scared about the nationalism there, but it was a great tank at the time and as a symbol, w- symbol of their victory. I mind. would I would love to see AC1s rumbling through Australian streets um, every Anzac day, if, <laughs> if only that we'd built enough and they'd maintain them. Uh, or even if they ran well enough to reliably do a... Vi- um, they just chew up the roads, John. Come on, don't yeah. you, can't you think of the cat's eyes? I, I, I'm saying if I was the Russians, I completely understand where they're coming from and I would do the same thing. And I actually, I like... I think this is actually Tank great. Parade. Come on, the, the, uh, but roar, think, of the, the I, roar of the diesel. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is great that these old war horses, instead of rotting in Namibian jungles, um, are being brought home and being given the, um, the, the, the Viking funeral that they deserve. Um, and, and frankly, for military hardware, which normally gets scrapped for its steel value, uh, it's nice to know that there's a happy ending in the 21st century for these 70 year old, um, things that frankly deserve the status of museum pieces. So this is, for me, this is a good story. Uh, I appreciate what it did and when it did it. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm worried about what the symbol it's going to provide into the future. But I don't have uh, optics on that, um, on what's happening in that space because we don't get that sort of media. Yeah, well, you can always read Russia Today. They'll tell you everything they want you to know. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, we've just crossed over the hour mark. So um, I think, folks, uh, we're going to be back next month. We will have another tank. We don't know what. We might have uh, another beer that might actually be country so, appropriate. In, in some way related to whatever we're talking about. That, um, that'd be good, Rob. If you, I don't know if you can manage that. Um, Russian listeners, do please suggest a beer. I'd love to find um, one. If, if you can suggest a way we can buy it that, that'll get shipped to Australia, we are keen for that. But just bear in mind, Alcohol, cross-border stuff gets complex. Uh, Okay. Um, Thank you very much, and we will be back soon. Totally tanked.